All right, so this is an example of what we call an autonomous equation. Or sometimes called time independent. And in general, it just means that the differential equation can be written as dy dt equals some function of just y. In other words, the rate of change of the function depends only on what the function's value is right now. It doesn't depend on what time it is. So for instance, this is an autonomous equation because the derivative equals something about just y itself. It doesn't involve any influence, any direct influence from the independent variable. As opposed to, for instance, like y prime equals y squared plus t squared. This, would, this equation would not be autonomous because it does depend on time. The rate of change of y depends not only on what the value of y is right now, but it also depends on what, to, what time it is, what the input is. So this would be non-autonomous. And one of the nice things about autonomous equations, first of all, they can all be solved by a certain method, at least in principle. In practice, it's not always gonna work out so easily. But in principle, if you have dy dt equals a function of just y, how could you always solve that in theory? What technique should always work? If this is a function of only y. Yeah, this should always be separable. In theory, all you need to do is divide both sides by f of y, multiply both sides by dt, and then you can integrate both sides. <clears throat> the right side, of course, is in a sense, it's just integral of one dt. That's just going to become t plus c. And as long as one over f of y can be integrated, then you can do that. And then at least you have an intrinsic solution. If you can isolate y, you also have an extrinsic solution. But in, in theory, at least, an autonomous equation can always be solved by separation of variables. The only problem, of course, is that one over f of y might not be easy to integrate but you can always at least write the solution in terms of integrals and then maybe use numeric approximation methods. However, actually solving it is not always the, the information we're looking for. In many cases, especially in, real, in re real world examples, we don't really care about the actual exact solution. We just wanna know what's happening to the solution after a long period of time. Does it approach some finite asymptote? Does it shoot off to infinity or negative infinity? or does it oscillate or what? We wanna know what's happening after a long time. And autonomous equations actually make that really easy to figure out <coughs> by analyzing the equilibrium solutions, like figuring out where or what y values just stay where they are forever. And then more specifically, what's going on near those values. And there are a few ways you can analyze this. One, one, way, one good way to start is by looking at what the graph of this function looks like. If we call this function f of y, if we actually try graphing that, graphing f of y gets us a good idea of what the behavior is as y changes. So if we make a graph of f of y versus y itself, First of all, the most important thing to look for is the zeros. What y values are gonna to lead to this whole thing being zero? Because those will be the equilibrium solutions, right? If we set y prime equal to zero, then that means we have equilibrium. We have a solution that's constant. So we wanna start by saying, where is y prime equal to zero? And this can be factored, right? What is this factor to? How would you factor y squared minus one? Yeah, that's y plus one times y minus one. So what are our, our roots here? What y values lead to this whole thing being zero? Yeah, zero, one, and negative one. So those are the points where the f of y graph is gonna cross the y axis. So if we mark those, 
And then what we really care about is in between, is it gonna be positive or negative? And we could check that just by plugging in some values. Like let's say you plug in a number greater than one. Let's say you plug in a million. A million squared is positive. A million squared minus one is definitely still positive. So anything to this side is gonna be positive. What if we plug in a number really far to the left, a number below negative one? Like you plug in negative a million, would the result be positive or negative? Yeah, should be positive because negative a million squared is positive. Negative a million squared is still positive. Minus one, still positive. Positive times positive. So that means that everything on the left side is gonna be positive. And then in between, let's say you plug in a point between zero and one, you plug in one half. One half squared, positive. One half squared minus one, that's gonna be negative. Positive times negative means negative. So it's gonna be negative in this region. Uh, what if we plug in negative one half? What sort of results are we gonna get? Also negative, right? In fact, the fact that all the y's are being squared, all the y's are raised to even powers means this is an even function. So it should be symmetric across the vertical axis. So it looks like our shape is gonna be something like this, sort of a W shape, which seems like a reasonable sort of shape for this because this is a quartic function. So we should expect possibly up to a W shape. But the important thing, we don't really care so much about the exact shape of f of y, we just care about where is it positive, where is it negative? And also to some extent, where is it kind of far from zero, where is it close to zero? Because the value of f of y represents the slope of the actual graph we're trying to make. And what we're gonna do now, now that we've got this idea of what the values of f of y are for various y values, we're going to turn this into a direction field. Though not exactly the entire direction field. The fact that this is autonomous means that if we were graphing t versus y, let's say we graph one column of the direction field, whatever that column happens to look like. So for a certain y value and t value, you've got a certain slope. What's gonna happen if you move to the right on the graph, increasing the t value? If you keep the same y value, but increase t, what should happen to y prime? What happens to this value if you change t, but keep y the same? Yeah, nothing happens. This is why we call it a time independent equation. This value doesn't, the value of y prime doesn't depend on t directly at all. If you keep y the same, but change t, you get the exact same y prime. Take this y value and this t value, you get a y prime, change t and you get the exact same y prime, exact same y prime. So once you've established one column of the direction field, you can just take that direction field and make a copy of it and paste, 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 and you've got your complete direction field. In other words, we don't need to draw the whole direction field. We just need one single column. And that one single column can be drawn in a sort of an abbreviated shorthand called a phase line. The phase line is the sort of idealized single column of the direction field. Looking at the y values, we already established the y values that are really important are one, zero, and negative one. Those are the equilibrium values. So let's mark those first. Y equals zero, y equals one, y equals negative one. If the, value, if the initial conditions are one of those values, if the graph starts at one of those values, it'll stay there forever. So these are all equilibrium in the sense that if y is one of those values then the slope is zero and it just stays there forever. But we also wanna know what's gonna happen near those values. 
if we're a little bit above or a little bit below, if we're in these in-between zones. And notice that this direction, this phase line is basically just the y-axis tilted up right like it's supposed to be. So we've marked one negative one, zero, and positive one. But now what we care about is the uh, y prime value, whether it's positive or negative. And notice that in the realm to the left of negative one, we've got positives. And to the right of positive one, we've also got positives. And then these in-between zones, we've got negatives. So if f of y is positive, for instance, in this region where y value is more than one, if f of y is positive, that means y prime is positive. And if y prime is positive, what does that tell you about the actual function, the actual solution? If you know a function's derivative is positive, what does that tell you about the function itself? Yeah, it's increasing. So that means if the y value is greater than one, then y prime is positive and therefore it's an increasing function. <clears throat> Likewise, if the y value is less than negative one, y prime is positive, so it's an increasing function. If y prime is, or if y is between negative one and zero or between zero and one, y prime is negative, so it would be a decreasing function. So we're basically just taking all the zones where y prime is positive and calling that an increasing function. Taking all the zones where y prime is negative and calling that a decreasing function. Any questions on that so far? And based on that, we can now see what type of equilibrium we're dealing with. For instance, at y equals one, it looks like everything's spreading out away from equilibrium. So what kind of equilibrium is that? Yeah, this would be unstable equilibrium. It still counts as equilibrium because if you start at exactly y equals one as your initial condition, you'll stay at y equals one forever. But if you start a little bit ab above, you'll, you'll go further up away from equilibrium. Or if you start a little bit below, you'll go further down away from equilibrium. As opposed to y equals negative one, it looks like everything there is go everything nearby is going towards equilibrium. So what do we call that? Yeah, that would be stable equilibrium. And then this one's sort of mixed between those. Some of the solutions are approaching it. Some of the solutions are going away from it. So what do we call that? Yeah, that would be semi-stable or sometimes called half stable because it looks stable from one side, but it looks unstable from the other side. Uh, and yeah, there are several different methods of doing this. The phase line, I think, is, the, in, is my favorite method just because it's so much more visual. You can really see, oh, this point has everything going away from it. This point has everything going towards it. So it's much more, uh, much more visual or geometric way to look at the uh, stability. There's also ways you can do this. Uh, were you using the derivative in class, like the derivative of f of y? Yeah, that's another way you can do that. Because the derivative of f of y tells you at each of those points, do you have a negative slope or a positive slope? Positive slope means you're changing from negative value to positive value, and that corresponds to unstable. Negative slope means you're changing from positive to negative, and that means you're changing from increasing towards to decreasing towards. So that means it's stable. Or if you've got a critical point like this one here, that corresponds to semi-stable. But I find it a lot easier to see what's going on by drawing out a phase line. That's a much more dynamic way of thinking about it as motion away or motion towards each of those equilibrium points. Again, there's many ways to do this, but as long as you can, as long as you have a method that allows you to figure out from the equation, figure out where the equilibrium points are and what's going on near those points, then that should be the important information. Any questions on that phase line so far? Now, if we want to actually sketch the solution curves, it's fairly straightforward to turn the phase line into a direction field. 
if we just draw out a y-axis that matches up with the phase line itself, like let's say this is y equals one, this is y equals zero, this is y equals negative one. So here's our t-axis and our y-axis. And we know that at uh, one, zero, and negative one, the slope will be zero. And no matter what the t value is, the slope will still be zero at those y values. And then if we fill in the in-between values, we can basically just look at the phase line and extrapolate from there. For instance, we know above y equals one, the slope is going to be positive. Presumably just a little bit positive if we're close to the uh, close to this equilibrium value and then steeper and steeper. Likewise, if we're below y equals one, we have a negative slope, just a little bit negative and then steeper, but then we're approaching another equilibrium. So it's gonna get less steep. <clears throat> Likewise, below zero, we get a negative slope, a little bit negative, then more negative, then more negative, but then less negative and pretty flat near equilibrium. And then below negative one, we've got to have a positive slope. Again, close to equilibrium, it'll be just a little bit positive, but then steeper and steeper the further we get from equilibrium. So this is the single column of the direction field that the phase line is describing. Any questions on that single column so far? And now we can basically just take each of those slopes and uh, progress it along the t direction because as t changes, the slope shouldn't change. So this slope, for instance, should be that same slope for all t values. This slope at this y value is the same slightly steeper slope for any t value. And likewise, this much steeper slope is the same no matter what the t value is. And then same thing with these. and these. So there's the direction field. Any questions on drawing that out so far? And then to draw in some sample solutions, we can basically just take any starting point, any initial value. And I would recommend choosing at least one initial value from each of those regions above one, between one and zero, between zero and negative one, and below negative one, and just follow the direction field lines. For instance, if we start here, we're just going to follow the direction field. Actually, let me use a different color for that. That's not so visible. If we start here, we just follow the direction field like so. Or if we were to start a little lower, we still follow the direction field and get a curve something like this. Or likewise, if we start down here, follow the direction field. Direction field says steep upward slope, but then getting less and less steep and actually approaching y equals negative one as an asymptote. In fact, all it looks like all of the curves down here are gonna be approaching y equals negative one as an asymptote. And then the in-between ones, this is where it gets a little tricky, but you still follow the same pattern. Let's say you start just a little bit below one. The direction field says negative slope, but kind of flat. A little bit later, it looks like we're further down. So the direction field is saying, go a little steeper and then a little steeper. But then once you get below about the halfway mark, not necessarily exactly halfway, but it looks like it's now getting less steep and less steep and less steep. So we get sort of a logistic type curve diverging away from one, but then flattening out to approach zero as the new asymptote. And it looks like all of the curves in this region are gonna do something like that. Likewise, below zero. A little below zero, we get a mostly flat negative slope, getting steeper and steeper, and then less steep and less steep. Ideally, you wanna be having a curve that's parallel 
to the nearest direction field arrows at all times. So that gives us a very good idea of what the behavior is here. We now have lots of sample curves in all these important regions. And of course, if you start at one, you stay there forever. If you start at zero, you stay there forever. If you start at negative one, you stay there forever. And all the other solutions are either diverging off to infinity or converging towards zero or converging towards negative one or converging upwards towards negative one. So we can now predict the behavior of all the solutions here. In fact, we could even write that as sort of a piecewise definition. If the initial value is above one, the limit goes to infinity. If the initial condition is between zero and one, the, initial, the uh, limit approaches zero. And if the initial condition is anywhere less than zero, all those solutions converge towards negative one. So we can categorize the types of solutions based on their initial conditions. Any questions on that so far? So that's the general idea of using the graph of f of y and the phase line to draw a direction field and then uh, sketching the curves. But even without bothering to draw in the direction field, you can still figure out where the equilibrium values are and using an analysis like this or using the uh, derivative of f of y, you can figure out which uh, types of equilibrium they are, stable, unstable, or semi-stable. And that's usually all the information we need. If you don't really care about the exact details of what's happening at every time, if all you care about is after a long time what's going on, then all you really need to know is where the equilibrium values are and what type they are, of course. That is, that's usually enough information to figure out the limits. Any other questions on that sort of analysis for autonomous equations? All right, then let's take a look at Euler's method. Euler's method is a way to approximate solutions of differential equations, even if they can't be solved analytically, by extending this idea of a direction field to algebra instead of geometry. Euler's method, pronounced Euler. Uh, let's say we, just as an example, let's say we have y prime equals 2t minus y as an example of a, a differential equation. And since this is linear, we should be able to solve it analytically. But let's explore how we would approximate the solution using Euler's method. The idea is first you want to put it in this format, y prime equals something, some function of t and y. <clears throat> so that at any location, any uh, t value and y value on the graph, you can just plug those in and find the slope. And of course you need an initial condition. Let's say our initial condition is, uh, y of zero equals one. So we've got a t value and a y value. t value is zero, y value is one. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at what's going on if we extend that a little bit further and see where we get to. So if we think of this as on a graph, we don't really need to draw out the entire direction field. We just need to know what's going on at this point. t equals zero, y equals one. We can actually calculate the slope just by plugging those in. If you plug in zero for t and one for y, what do you get for the slope there? Plug in zero for t, plug in one for y, and what do you get? y prime equals negative one. So that tells us at that location, the slope is negative one. And of course, as soon as we move away from that point, the slope is gonna change. But we can imagine that, it, just as an approximation, we can imagine that it's mostly a straight line near that point. So let's imagine we just go for one space in that direction. We get to a new location from zero one, down one over one, now we're at the point 
one zero. And we can recalculate the slope there. If you plug in one for t, zero for y, two times one minus zero, we get two as the slope. So at this point, the slope is positive two. Let's say we go one space further to the right. One to the right, two up. And we're now at the location two, two, because we've gone one space to the right from t equals one. And because it's slope two, we've also gone two spaces up. And we can recalculate the slope there as well. Plug in two for t, two times two is four, minus two, because that's the y value. And that means the slope is still two. Continue over one, up two. We're now at three, four. And then we can plug that in again. Plug in three for t, plug in four for y. Two times three minus four, that's six minus four is two. So we're still at slope two. So it looks like we're getting at least an approximation. The actual curve, of course, is not going to look like this. The actual curve might be something more like this. But we at least get a pretty good approximation near that point. So this is the core of Euler's method. We're taking the initial conditions, use the derivative or the differential equation to calculate the slope at that point, continue in that direction as if it's a straight line, then at some new location on that line, recalculate the slope, go in that direction for a while, stop, recalculate the slope of that new point, go in that direction for a while and keep going. And you get this connect the dots graph that forms an approximation of the actual solution. Any questions on the idea behind that so far? So let's see if we can formalize this a little bit. Instead of just drawing it out as a bunch of points, typically we can write this as a data table. If we want to keep track of a t value and a y value, and we also want to keep track of a y prime value, which is just going to be 2t minus y in this case. And also we want to look into how far are we going to get to the next point? How far to the right and how far up or down? So we're going to want to have a delta t column and a delta y column. How far we're going to the right on the graph, how far we're going up on the graph. So we started with conditions 0, 1. So those are just the initial conditions, the starting values. And those are sometimes called t sub 0 and, t and y sub 0. We plug those into y prime. 2 times 0 minus 1 is negative 1. And then we're going to need to go some distance to the right, some distance up or down on the graph, specifically down because it's a negative slope. But to figure out how far, let's take a look at the definition of slope in the first place. What does slope actually mean? Just going back to the basic elementary school, junior high, high school definitions of slope. What was the first introduction to slope you got? It's a rate of change, right? Which means it's a ratio, delta something over delta something else. Specifically on this graph, delta what over delta what? Yeah, delta y over delta t. So that's the slope of the tangent, the slope of the actual graph, or the, the rate of change of the actual graph. But if you're talking about on a very small scale, that is approximately equal to dy over dt. So these are not exactly the same thing. Formally, delta y over delta t tells you how much y is changing on the actual graph divided by how much t is changing on the actual graph. Whereas dy dt is the slope of the tangent line. But those are going to be fairly close to each other. Let's say you have a graph that looks like this. And we're talking about comparing this point, t0, y0, to this point, t1, y1. 
if we draw a tangent line at this point, delta y over delta t, or sorry, dy over dt is the slope of the tangent line. So dy dt is the slope of the tangent line, whereas delta y over delta t is the slope of the straight line from a point on the curve to the next point on the curve. So a change in y over change in t. Note that those are not exactly the same. The slope of the, the line from point to point, the secant line, is not exactly the same as the slope of the tangent line, y prime. But they're pretty close to each other, especially if we're talking about a small interval of t, a very short interval. So we can say that the slope of the tangent line and the slope of the secant line are almost the same if we're talking about a small interval. And we can calculate the slope of the tangent line. That's y prime here. So if we say y prime is approximately delta y over delta t, delta t, we're just going to be going forward some specific amount, which we usually call h, h for horizontal step. And that's just a constant. We go forward one, forward one, forward one, or something like that. But for delta y, how would you solve for delta y here? If you wanted to isolate delta y here to figure out how much you're going up or down. How would you actually isolate delta y there? Is there any way you can get rid of this delta t? What's the opposite of dividing by delta t? Yeah, we just multiply both sides by delta t, and we get y prime times delta t. So that means if we have a t step, if we know how far we're going in the t direction, we can just multiply y prime times that delta t and find how far we're going in the y direction. And like I said, the delta t step, we can choose any delta t step we want. Typically, we just use a constant for that value, which we call h. That means we can find the delta y value by just taking the y prime value we calculate here and multiplying by h, how far we're going in the t direction. So let's try that. Let's say for our delta t step, we chose a, a step of one when we were drawing it out. And it turned out that just led to a straight line, which is not very accurate. So let's use a smaller t step. Typically, the smaller the t step is, the smaller h is, the more accurate your result is going to be. So let's try using 1 half. Negative 1 times 1 half, because that's the delta y. You can find delta y by multiplying the slope times how far you're going to the right. Negative 1 times 1 half should be negative 1 half. So we now know we're going in the t direction, we're going half a step forward as our just constant half a step forward, half a step forward, half a step forward. But we now know in that half a step forward, y is going down by half a step. So now we can find the new t value by taking our old t value and adding our t step, 0 plus 1 half. And we can find our new y value by taking our current y value and adding how far we're going in the y direction one plus negative one half. And now that we have a new point, a new y value and a new t value, we can combine those with the differential equation to find the new slope. Any questions on that so far? So let's try calculating that. Plug in one half for t, plug in one half for y, we get two times one half minus one half. So that's one minus one half. That means at this new location, the slope is going to be positive one half. We take our same delta t step, because we're assuming the same h step the whole time. 
But now to get delta y, we multiply y prime times h. y prime times h, that is the slope times how far we're going in the t direction. 1 half times 1 half is 1 fourth. So that means in the next step, we're going 1 half forward in the time direction and 1 fourth up, since this is positive 1 fourth, in the y direction. So we can add those to the t and y values we have right now. The, our current t value is 1 half. We add delta t, 1 half plus 1 half is 1. Our y value right now is 1 half. We add our delta y, 1 half plus 1 fourth is 3 fourths. So that's our new t and y value. And we can keep this going. Plug in 1 for t, plug in 3 fourths for y, we get 2 times 1 is 2, minus 3 fourths is 1 and a fourth, or 5 fourths. And then our t step, we're going to keep using the same 1 half. There's no reason you really have to use the same t step the whole time. It's just very convenient to do so, so you don't have to be changing that all the time. And then delta y, we just multiply y prime times the t step, h. So 5 fourths times 1 half would be 5 eighths. So that means in this next half a second or half an interval of time, we go up 5 eighths in the y direction, over 1 half, up 5 eighths. Add those to the values we have right now. 1 plus 1 half would be 1 and a half, or 3 halves. 3 fourths plus 5 eighths would be 11 eighths. Let me just move these as mixed numbers then, or oh, improper fractions. 11 eighths. And then you can continue from there. Plug in this new t value and this new y value into the differential equation to find the new slope at that point. And you can keep this going as long as you want. For instance, let's say you wanted to, what you actually wanted to find was what's the y value when t is 5. You would keep this going until you get t equals 5, y equals some value. And that may take a while. If you're going by half steps, getting from 0 to 5 is going to take 10 steps, 10 lines of working out these values. And that's not going to be all that accurate. A t-step of 1 half is a pretty big jump. You can get more accuracy by using smaller steps. So let's say you wanted to go uh, more accurate. Let's say you use a t-step of 1 tenth. If you're just going 1 tenth each step, how many steps does it take to get to t equals 5? If you're just going a tenth of a second each step. So if you're just going 0, 1 tenth, 2 tenths, 3 tenths, 4 tenths, how many steps does it take to get to t equals 5? It takes 10 steps to get to t equals 1, because you're getting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 tenths is 1. How many steps would it take to get to 5? Yeah, 50 steps. And that's going to take a very long time if you're working it out by hand. So this is really the trade-off here. You can get more accuracy by using a smaller h value, a smaller t step but it also takes much more time. It takes more steps, more calculations in order to do this. However, if all you're really doing is writing out a list of numbers and then doing the same calculations, same calculations, same calculations over and over again, what are we really building here? What's a tool that could do this a lot faster? What sort of tool is specifically designed to do the same sort of calculations over and over and over again? Yeah, a computer. What we've basically been doing is specifically writing out a spreadsheet by hand. But this can be done a lot faster by setting it up as a spreadsheet on a computer. So open up Open Office or Excel or whatever your favorite spreadsheet program is. If you just type in manually 0 and 1, whatever the initial conditions are, then here you can enter a formula. You can say equals 2 times this value minus this value. You can set up a formula that refers back to the previous values. And then this value is just going to be some constant. You would just type in 1 half and copy paste. <clears throat> this value is just going to be equals this times this. So you can fill in formulas. Once you've filled in a couple of rows of formulas, you can just select an entire row and drag it down as far as you want. And the spreadsheet will automatically update the formulas to the new rows. 
So you can type in the first couple of rows as formulas and then drag it down as far as you want and have 50 steps or 100 steps or 1,000 steps in almost no time at all. And the really nice thing about doing this on a computer spreadsheet program is you can then select the first two columns and tell the spreadsheet to graph it. And you'll get a very nice scatter plot of the solution curve. And it's still just a connect the dots approximation of the solution, but the smaller you make to the delta t, the smaller you make the t step, the more accurate that solution will be. So try this out, open up a spreadsheet and try writing out this sort of uh, calculation network in a spreadsheet. Fill in the initial conditions manually, but then everything else should be done as formulas. And those formulas can refer to the other cells you've already got. So that's Euler's method, a very convenient method of approximating what the solution curve should look like by doing this connect the dots point to point approximation. Any other questions on that? All right, see you next time.